Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Sinclair. Thank you for having me. To get us started, could you share a little bit about your personal background, where you grew up, what your family was like, things like that? Sure. Um, I grew up in New York and Los Angeles. So my family uh, immigrated to the US. They were Jamaican and they came to New York like many Jamaicans do. Uh, my parents divorced when I was about two. And eventually when I was about nine, my mother moved to Los Angeles where her family was. Um, yeah, so I'm a, a coastal big city person. I'd love to hear more about your life as a researcher. How is it similar to what you imagined and, and what are some of the differences? It is funny. I don't think I really understood what I was signing up for when I went to graduate school. I didn't, don't think I really understood I was signing up for the life of a researcher. And I don't think I really understood what that was. So I couldn't really say that I had expectations. Um, know that, you know, there are these societal expectations um, about what life of a researcher is like. So my husband gets very upset when people insinuate that I take the summers off. So he's like, you don't know how hard she works. She works in the summer doing research. Um, or I think there's also a sort of idea of what a scientist is where you're serious all the time and all the words you use have three syllables and you, um, it isn't, it, it isn't fun. But so contrary to those expectations, um, my life as a researcher, it's hard. I work really hard. I do work. It, I get up, I you know, do professor stuff all day. I take care of my son and my family. And as soon as Marshall goes to bed most nights, I do more work afterward. And on Saturday, my rule is I try and take Saturday off. But if I have some really cool data analysis to do, I'll do that because I really like doing data analysis. So maybe that doesn't count as work. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of work and it's always on my mind. Um, but at the same time, well, especially when things are going well, it's joyous. I mean, my lab is great. The graduate students, the undergraduates, the postdocs, um, I do a lot of work now with Nicole Shelton, who's wonderful. Um, and we have fun together. I love taking a new idea and translating it into something that's testable that feeling when you get a new data set and you don't know how it's going to turn out, it feels like a roller coaster, like the top of the roller coaster. Um, and sometimes you do crash and burn, but then, you know, you pick yourself up and you keep going together. I, yeah, it's not the way I think people think it is. I think in some ways it's more intense, but also in some ways it's much more fun. So I'm, I'm curious about how the research you do um, might be impacted or reflective of your personal background or, or your sense of, of who you are. Can you talk with me a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, there, it's who I am and the research that I do, it's tied, they're tied together, I think, in an interesting way. Um, I was drawn to social psychology because of who I am and sort of my desire to understand prejudice and stereotyping and make a difference on behalf of my community. Uh, I don't think I really understood what being a psychology researcher was. I, I mean, I very naively, but genuinely at some point thought, well, prejudice, you know, I'm gonna use the scientific method to cure that. I'm gonna let everybody know what the cure is and we'll be good to go. But um, people are much more complicated. The world is much more complicated. I don't think there's will be a there will not be a single cure. Um, I will be in business for a very long time. Uh, and the 
life of a researcher when you're researching something this complicated, you know, isn't that sort of directly satisfying? Like I fixed it. Um, it, at least for me. Um, but for me, it can be, or what I've learned to just be very satisfied by is showing it that you know, there's, I feel like there's a perspective on the world that doesn't necessarily, other people can't necessarily see or might not necessarily get represented in the science of psychology, but that I can see. And I really enjoy unpacking it. And I think it's, it feels important to me to unpack it in a way that other people can see it too. Um, and this sounds really silly, but you know, when I'm running and I sort of explain myself to myself in my head, I feel a little bit like, it's like being a, a painter with a lot of rules because you know you want the picture to be understandable by, to anyone who looks at it. Uh, and yeah, and so it's very personal in that they're, they're my paintings. Right now, there's, there's a lot of focus globally on uh, prejudice. And we know that in terms of, of beliefs, there doesn't seem to be much changes in terms of people's self-reported beliefs about different types of bias and, and prejudices that they might hold. However, we do see a rise in the number of actions uh, resulting from that. How can your research help us understand um, why there's, there's this difference in, in thoughts and, and behaviors? I think there are a couple of answers to that. Um, one answer is in the dis disjuncture between explicit and implicit biases. So there is this idea that there's self-reported biases that people have, that they are willing and sometimes more than willing to communicate, they are know of about themselves. And that contributes to certain behaviors. And then there's this idea of implicit or subtle biases that people don't necessarily know about themselves or maybe they have a feeling or an intuition, but they don't articulate it to themselves as bias, or maybe they just you know, try to not articulate it to themselves at all. And that also relates to um, certain behaviors. Um, and so what we, I suspect, is that these implicit biases relate to a host of behaviors and in the research, or not in my research in particular, but in a lot of frameworks like um, the ambivalent, uh, ambivalent racism framework, when things are ambiguous, our um, implicit biases are more likely to affect our behavior. So as we, we enter a period in time, for example, where what's normatively more ambiguous, what's what is right or what is wrong becomes more muddied, then those gut level instincts, those implicit biases are more likely to affect our behavior than in times, historical times or particular contexts where um, what is deemed fair and appropriate is clear. And it's not because um, in those, un it's because in those uncertain times, what you're supposed to do isn't clear. And so you, your gut just kind of leads you. But in those more certain times, people really wanna do the right thing, right? It's easier for them to tell what the right thing is. And I think that is contributing um, to some of what we see in terms of biases in the, the modern era. I think more generally, and this isn't tied to the research in particular, but it is tied to the notion of implicit bias, that bias is super complicated. And so as people try to do the right 
what the right thing on one hand, they also are still driven by their in-group biases. And, and so those things can continue to slip in in ways that are, that are unexpected. So for example, we are doing some research now where we're looking at implicit biases in educational context. And I, I won't talk about the actual field research because it's not out yet, but we have an experimental analog that has been published. So we had students come into the lab and they were black or white students. Well, they were all white students who came into the lab to teach and they taught either a black or a white um, peer some novel information about some period in history hardly anybody knows about. And you know, they got the materials and they made a lesson plan for their peer and then they taught the material to their peer and then we gave their peer a test. And we also measured the implicit and explicit biases of everybody. And what we found was the more um, biased the teacher was, the less well their black um, student did on the exam. And, right, it was a test of the material. So that it was literally like the less well their Black student learned. And there, wa there was a relationship with explicit bias, um, which we don't know the mechanism for, um, but there was an interesting relationship with the teacher's implicit bias. And what seemed to be happening once we watched the videotapes of these teaching interactions, was that the more biased teacher was more nervous because they were trying to control their biases. They were trying to, you know, they had these weird, uncomfortable feelings and they were trying to manage those. Uh, and they were so busy trying to manage those feelings that they literally taught a lesson that was less effective. And that's why their African-American students um, did less well. So when we showed the, just the videos to non-Black students, they performed exactly like the Black students because the problem was in the lesson. Um, and those students in that experiment, I suspect, they, right, they were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to keep it together. Um, but they were so focused on trying to keep it together that they inadvertently were poor teachers. And, and, and I think that illustrates why it's so complicated and why this is a problem that's, you know, very difficult to fix and why we'll struggle with it for a while because it can, you know, you, it's like whack-a-mole. You, you whack it here and then something else will pop up over there. You know, whenever I, I try to teach or, or to talk about um, prejudices and, and stereotypes with students, with family, with friends, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm coming to the conversation um, with certain parts of my, my identity being obvious, so that I'm a, a white woman. Um, and, I, and I'm aware that everyone else who's, who's having the conversation with me has, has their own identities that are, are going to be influencing them as well. So, so how do we begin to disentangle all of this so that we can have um, genuine conversation and have real learning take place to, to get us to a point of, of progress? That's part of the reason I love science, because <laughs> we, um, at least at first, we don't need to agree. Um, we don't need to believe the same thing, but we can agree upon the shared set of facts. So I teach a class called Prejudice. Prejudice causes consequences and cures. And there's a very long speech in the first day um, that sort of sets a tone for the class. And one of the things I always tell them is what you believe is not my business. Um, you know, how you feel, uh, you know, is, is not for me to tell you. Um, all I want is for you to learn the research, to, to learn it and also to be able to critique it in terms of the scientific merit and not separate that from your personal beliefs. Um, you can, you know, if you know the finding and you know the study and you you know the critiques of it, you can not like it or not believe it. That's totally fine with me. Um, but let's just 
you know, this is as factual as things can be. I mean, knowledge still knowledge evolves, but let's see this together. And I think that's a great starting place. Um, I am a scientist in part because I think that perspective is persuasive. If you know like a certain set of facts, it's a little bit hard to say really glib things like, prejudice is over. I mean, it's, it's just not, um, but, but, you know, but that I'm saying that like in not a personal assertion kind of way, I'm saying that literally there are all of these different ways people have documented the presence of, of biases in the modern day. And um, yeah, that works for me as a conversation, as a conversation starter. I also think um, or, or also I lean toward or value the idea of trying to perspective take, be empathetic, be gentle with one another. Um, for the most part, many, most people mean well. And I think that remembering that um, affords a better, more productive conversation uh, than sort of assuming worst intentions. As you look forward to the future of this field, what are some of the things that excite you that you'd like to share with, with anyone watching this video? Um, the host of opportunities in terms of interesting questions to ask. Uh, so in particularly in the domain of intergroup relations, there are a lot of questions around intersectionality that we have just ignored for literally decades. And I feel like I have more students with an interest and an appetite to answer those questions. And also our methods have become more complex and rich. So we, I think we're better, better able to tackle kinds of questions like that. Um, so yeah, there are there are always new and interesting questions to ask. And so as I look into the future, I'm just excited to see what those questions are. And I'm excited to see the ones that I have no answers to being answered, um, like questions about intersectionality. Um, and I'm also excited by the expansion in the range of methods that we embrace. So, yeah, there, this new methodological terrain just affords an ability to ask things in a way that we couldn't. And it is really thrilling when you think about the ramifications that to see where we can go. I mean, we can now do experiments with literally millions of people. Um, or whereas, I talk a lot about it being difficult to cure bias, but there's proliferation of uh, intervention studies and many of them are effective. And then, and we also now have the tools to figure out the context in which, in which they're effective, in which they're, in which they're not effective and why are they effective? So we can make them more effective and we can get them out to the public. And so, yeah, I think it's going to be a renaissance um, for psychology in, in the near future. And yeah, I don't think it's gonna look the same. Um, and I'm excited to see what it's going to look like. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk with me today. I really appreciated our, our conversation and, and thank you.